Hi, I'm Wild Bill. It's, wow, 2.20 p.m., 13th of March, 2022. Amazing. Uh, I've been recording video, some of it I liked, some of it I didn't. I haven't been playing piano because I'm just taking it easier on my hands. So. But I have been thinking about my journey through the fighting arts and how it's different, I think, than everyone else's, like most of my life is different than everyone else's. And I'm kind of glad for that because for the bad things I wouldn't want anyone else to have to suffer through. And for the good things, well, I hope everyone else gets to have their own version of mine. I'd like to talk about my experience with the fighting arts. Because I talk about the fighting arts quite a bit. You might wonder why I think I know. Well, when I was young, I uh, trained briefly with Ray Schaefer at uh, car school. It's not compatible with that system. Then went to um, Dan Kessner's Shorinru uh, Dojo above Dave's lunch counter at 10th Street. Dave's made some great food. And it has some pinball machines of the old style. Uh, 49er, you know, the one where the mule kicks the, the guy and they both spin around. I could go in there 20 minutes before my lesson and drop a, a nickel in and play the whole time and leave five or six games racked up, maybe ten games racked up. And Dave didn't mind that because that brought other people in. They'd play the free games and they'd want to eat. So it was not bad for him. I go upstairs to my karate lesson. My sensei was Dan Kessner, USKA uh, I think what the word is. At any rate, he was approved by the USKA. And he was um, accredited, that's what I meant. And he was uh, one hell of a man, really. Ex Navy SEAL. He had trained in Okinawa uh, uh, and or been stationed in Okinawa. That's where he had learned about karate. Uh, he had learned uh, at Masoyama School. And Masoyama was one of the great guiding lights of modern karate. Masayama, in case you don't know, is the guy who was highly publicized as knocking a bull unconscious with a bare hand. Mm, how about that? Strongman stunt. There's a reason why I'm going to call it a strongman stunt. Well, Dan learned by Masayama, who had learned by uh, uh, Giichi Funakoshi, Funakoshi who was one of, I think, four students that came over with their master from Okinawa in the first place. So, Funakoshi has quite a bit to say on the subject of karate. As a matter of fact, the book on karate, the Shotokan, he wrote. So, uh, indeed, he has a life story, Karate My Way of Life, Karate Do, um, which is a fascinating read. You should read it. It's his autobiography. And it talks about the changing of the guard in Japan uh, during the Meiji Restoration, which changed everything for the Japanese, from the Tokugawa shogunate to the new empire. Uh, it's a big change. A lot of people have lost their careers and lost their way. Anyway, but Funakoshi tells us that Shorinru, which is the style I was taught by Dan Kester, who was taught it by Masayama, who was taught it by Funakoshi Gage. Um, is a Japanese translation meaning Shaolin style. That's right, Shorin means Shaolin. How about that? And so Funakoshi was teaching a style of self-defense derived from the Shaolin school training. How about that? I mean, something, does anyone else know it out there? that was worth knowing for you. That Shaolin means, or that Shorin means Shaolin. And Shorin Ru means Shaolin style. How about that? So, I trained with Dan, I don't know, a year and a half, two years? It's a big deal for me. I wasn't compatible with that school either because I'm a poet. Uh, everything's an existential crisis to me. And that's why I write poetry. Because I can't deal. And, you know, Karate school is full of things you can't deal with as a poet. So, there for a while, 
learn quite a bit, have about a green belt's level of understanding of shorter. Well, after that, I practiced, practiced, pra practiced on the um, on the fantail of my ship in the Navy every day. Out there doing my shore recatus, caught us. Practicing, 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 practicing for years. Uh, along the way, now I didn't learn any new karate, mind you. I just kept practicing the same old karate because I only knew so much. I'm watching, you know, martial arts movies, and fighting arts movies, and, you know, wuxia movies, and, you know, flying swords and all that. And occasionally I would look at something from one of those movies, a Jackie Chan movie or a Carter Wong movie or a Wang Chang Lee movie, and I'd say, wait, is he doing something that, what, what, how is he striking with that? And I would ask a friend who was a legitimate fighting artist, a sports, sports fighting artist, and he would say, well, he's not doing that with the edge of his hand or with his fingers. He's doing that with his palm heel, and it just looks like he's clawing at the guy already. This is just how the movies show it, though. You know, obviously he's not ripping somebody with his very valuable fingers. He's smashing them with his palm. So I learned this stuff from integrating with the few people I knew who were legitimate fighting artists. I, I know a few, and they're formidable men and a woman. So along the way somewhere, one of my friends, one of those friends, as a matter of fact, says, you know what, I can get cheap practice swords. You want to practice sword? I says, yeah. So he brought in a bunch of rattan uh, bokuto, bokuto, wooden swords, uh, Japanese ones, which are shaped like the okatana, the large katana, and also the wakagashi, which is the short sword. And uh, we practiced with them for a while. We had time. We had some fun with them. And uh, that's how I learned to break a stick, you know, to strike a man with your weapon and break his weapon while keeping yours intact. And once we both learned that, there was no reason to do that anymore because we just break each other's sticks. <laughs> Makes sense. So I still have the last one of those that I never broke. And I've used it on all kinds of things. I've practiced with it for years. It's literally 40 years old. It's a 40-year-old wooden sword. It's never been maintained. I just kept swinging it, sometimes macking stuff with it, you know. So working out with the sword gave me something that nothing else did. It was the greatest exercise tool ever developed by man. I used to get out of the spit uh, in Sharpsburg. And I would work out with that sword for an hour just flailing around and swinging around and jump off the ground and do reverse kicks and push it in one way and my kick in the other way and try all the kinds of little tricks maybe that would work for me, you know, teaching myself how to be comfortable with the sword. In the process, I learned to do things that are hard to do. I learned to walk with the sword without it swinging back and forth and absorbing energy from me. I learned to place the sword on me so it was I was able to carry it with authority with a minimum of attention. I learned to do it sounds like silly stuff, but it's very important for you. It's like knowing where to put your feet when you mount a horse. You know, that's very important stuff. I never got any good at the sword. I have friends who are legitimate sword masters. I don't stand anywhere near them in that ranking. Nowhere. Because what I was learning from the sword was things that other people don't need to be taught or things that they don't teach. And one of those is Okay, I love to swing it around, and swing it up over my head, swing it way down and way over here. But really, no attack is going to come at me from there. Every attack is going to come at me from the direction I'm facing, from my center. I mean, if the guy comes at me from the right, I'm going to turn to the right. If the guy comes at me from the left, I'm going to turn to the left. If three opponents attack me, let's discuss that separately. See what I mean? Then you move with the engage one opponent to move the others away from you as they close in he's in their way and then he tries to get out of their way that gives you the option on him and now you take the second man and make him be in the way of the third man this is the difference between single and multiple opponents you already know all this stuff I'm sure dogs already know this stuff so humans learn it pretty quick so I practiced with a sword. You know what? I, you know what happened? I built lats. I built like a, that V look. I built that just from working with the sword, going down every day on the tracks, going down the spit every day, 
went down spit during 93 in march of 93 we had a giant blizzard here we had two feet of snow on the ground big fat flakes were falling everywhere and i crunched on down to the down to 13th street marine and crunched on down through the parking lot crunched on down to the spit and pulled my sword out i have a story about that's on my youtube channel because it was quite a day so i worked out with that sword and i worked out with that sword and sometimes i would practice karate while i was working out with the sword and sometimes i would practice karate alone sometimes i practice the sword alone and this grew to having a certain competence in understanding where my body was in space, in time and space. So I wasn't bashing myself off of walls or, you know, kicking stuff or by accident. Or I started having a precision to my ability to be in a place, which I lost again when I started dancing, by the way. I flail my hands around and do all the wrong things. But when it came to the sword and my fists, I realized I didn't want to be reaching behind myself. I wanted to be facing my enemy turning my side toward him, turning my center line toward him. And that in the process, I was learning things about the center line and what the center line's about and why you use a sword, why you don't use a mace or a club, why you use a sword or a spear, why the spear is the king of all weapons in Chinese mythology. Because the spear is a weapon for taking the opponent's center line. And the center line has all the main chakra in it. And if you want to be less mystical, all the big arteries. So you like stick a person in the center line, well, you're probably going to get an artery. He's probably going to bleed to death. That's the way it goes. So that's what the center is. And when you first read or talk about it or are instructed in it, the instructor or the author tells you that you're supposed to take the center from the enemy. And now you've won the fight. Of course, because you can thrust into his center line, the center line chakra are all deadly points to attack. All right, that makes sense. So, as I get along a little farther, I start running into a different idea, a modification of that concept of taking the enemy center. Get this, you let the enemy think he has the center, but when he lunges, he knocks your blade into his center line. Wow. That's so far beyond me. But I understand the concept of it. And I see why it works. And this is what a master swordsman does. A good swordsman, a great swordsman, can take the enemy's center. But a master swordsman makes the enemy think he's got the center. And the enemy just drives the master sword right into his guts. Not knowing, thinking that he's got it picked. He's th thinking that he's got the master beat. So this is where my comprehension went as I worked out. Because I wasn't working out with opponents. I wasn't learning the things you learn when you work out with opponents. While I was doing it autodidactically, teaching myself and having my experience vicarious from reading the ma manuals, from watching films of master's work, from watching movies, which are a bad place to learn anything except if you know what you're looking for. And I was looking for choreography because every choreography scene in a fight, every fight scene in a movie is choreographed and all that choreography can be equated to katas. Yes, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And there's bad katas and good ones. There's ones that teach you lessons you're gonna need and other ones that teach you lessons you probably won't need. And that depends on you and your place and your time and what weapons are being used. So, and then one day, watching a choreographer work, I recognized something that I don't think many people know. I recognized that the body is a series of springs and that drunken style, which is the closest thing to what I practice now is drunken style. Drunken style utilizes those natural springs and all those crazy movements and stuff are derived from a system whereby you make a movement and that cocks energy into your body. You turn to the right, you draw your elbow, your right elbow back. You now have cocked a spring that's ready to fire. If you don't let go of that spring immediately, then, then you waste the energy. 
you know, you're, oh, I'm still standing here waiting, I'm waiting. No, no you're spending energy. You're not waste, You're not storing energy. So you take it, you move to store the energy, and then you release it immediately to release energy, to redirect that energy. And that is the basis behind what's called the Shuto, the karate chop of karate. I didn't know. For years I thought, really, I thought I would move my hand a certain way and strike the opponent with the edge of my hand. That wasn't it at all. It's you pull the Shuto back till the palm is facing the side of your face. And that pulling the off fist back on your hip cocks your body. That whole thing cocks your body up, stores about a third of the weight of your body energy right there and then whack you step forward or you lean forward or you torque forward and you are delivering an enormous amount of, of energy from a rigid arm from a strong point yeah bam hit him in the clavicle bam hit him in the throat bam hit him on the side of the neck bam hit him on the side of the cheek bam hit him on the temple with a piece of your hand that can do that so, this is what the Shuto is, the karate chop is Shuto, which is, uh, I think it's um, hand sword. I know the toe is sword, so it's something sword. I, I call it sword strike. And what it is, is it's a club, just like mostly a sword is. A sword is a club with an edge on it, and the edge helps the club do more damage because it causes tissue damage that can't be repaired or absorbed. A slice isn't like a bruise. You can bruise a guy multiply and he can still fight. But if you slice a guy <laughs> multiply, he's probably going down. So, so I learned that. I learned that the body is a series of springs that you can cock and release and cock and release. And that, more than even watching the guys train, taught me what drunken style was all about. And so now I can use the motions of drunken style to cock my fist, to cock my blow, to store energy for delivering it back. That's fun. Just knowing that is like so cool for me. However, the things that I've learned and the level that I got to, because I can now do drunken swords sometimes, mean nothing. It's all dry as a bone because my hands are too messed up for me to use it with authority. I couldn't pick up a sword and use it to fight. Uh, my hands would lock up and the first time I struck somebody they'd like let go again, that'd be the end of me. Uh, that's all, you know. But as I overtook my body's ability to learn, I specialized in my brain's ability to learn. And my brain has learned quite a bit from all of this. And now I'm at the point where, in this weird little way, I have achieved a form of mastery. In a fighting art. In several fighting arts. And not a bit of it is worthwhile in a fight. How about that? This is Sartre's no exit. Where you have everything you want, but it's nothing compared to what you need. So it's beautiful and it's wisdom. And as I've said to many people, they'll remember, all wisdom is pain. The word nostalgia means our pain. Wisdom is pain. Because, you know, I could do that. I could be one hell of a fighter. But I'm too broke down to be a fighter. How about that? So, when I learn something about karate, kung fu, something about wushu, something about taekwondo, something about tang sudo, something about... Shang-Chi Mantis. I look at it as though I were still young. What would my body do with that? And then I think, ah, oh, that applies to this thing I learned. And then suddenly there's like a train of understanding. I'm starting to get a clue as to what makes a great warrior on the field. Strategy is still too much for me. Can you imagine after all my years of reading strategy, I'm still like, uh, I don't get it. But at least this part of it. So if you ever want to know what my real attainment is in martial arts and fighting arts, that was it. I'm a guy that sits and reads and watches and thinks about what he's read and what he's watched and applies it to his life lessons. Wild Bill.